You're listening to KRUU LP 100.1 FM, the voices of Fairfield, Iowa and beyond. Grassroots listener supported, community powered and solar powered radio broadcasting live from the Cultural District in Fairfield, Iowa. And this is Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley. And unfortunately, Caroline is not able to be with us today. She wasn't able to drive over from Mount Pleasant where she lives today. But we will have her back in the studio with us next week. So, as I said, this is Writers' Voices, and this is the show where we talk to writers and publishers and other people that are involved with the the world of letters. And our guest today has been involved with the world of letters her entire life, I think, or at least for a very, very long time. Rhoda Orm Johnson is the author of Inside Maharishi's Ashram, A Personal Story. Rhoda Orm Johnson holds a BA in Mathematics and Philosophy from Vassar College and an MA and PhD in Comparative Literature from the University of Maryland. After a stint as a computer programmer on the Apollo Project, just like those hidden figures, ladies, and graduate school teaching, she learned the TM technique and became a TM teacher in Italy in 1972. And she has been involved with the transcendental, me- um, transcendental meditation movement since that time, including a long time as faculty and chair of the Department of Literature and Languages at Maharishi International University, which is now the Maharishi University of Management. And... Um, Rhoda spends half her year now in Florida and half the year here in Fairfield, Iowa. Welcome back to Writer's Voices, Rhoda. Good to be here. Thank you. Because <laughs> you were with us before. Up, um, I believe that was a, a chapter that you had in... Symphony of Silence, George yes. Ellis's book. Yes, yeah. we talked about that briefly. Yeah. So, and that, was that, um, was that essay... Is that essay part of this book? No, that was just generated for his book. Okay. The impetus to write this book occurred a year or two later. Oh, really? <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Okay. I was given a copy of Prudence Farrow's um, Dear Prudence, the story behind the song. She gave it to me for my birthday two years ago. Mm-hmm. And I read that and I thought, I have a story to tell. Because I was behind the scenes <clears throat> with Murray She for over 40 years. Mm. And I saw him acting as a world figure, as uh, a master to disciples, as a very wise, wonderful person. And not everybody has had that experience or that view. And not everybody who's had that experience or view can write. So I thought, I have an obligation to tell this story. And I plunged in. So Rhoda, about when did you start working on, on writing this the book? book? Yes, um, it was the fall of last year. Uh, no, no, fall of the previous year, the fall of two thousand and fifteen. You must be a fast writer. <laughs> I, I, I am a fast writer, but this book just poured out blissfully in about four months. And you had never thought of doing this before? No, and I wasn't prepared. Did um, you have journals? Have you well, been a journal keeper? I did keep a diary of when we went to Armenia and taught TM behind the Iron Curtain. There, I We got there, and I know, this is historic. I bought a little book, and I wrote in it every okay. day. But um, I had did have course notebooks and kind of things I wrote in from time to time over those 45 years. And when we left MIU, I thought I'm not going to need those anymore, and I was ready to throw them away. But my husband, who was planning to do a book of his own one day, he took them all and hid them away. So when I started on this project, he brought them all out and dropped them on my lap and said, you might be able to use these. (laughs) There was a treasure house of knowledge, because I take good notes, things that Marshy said, that he's things that happened, you know, like that. So, and then I had our family photographs, you know, being a family, we have two children. So I would take out those photograph books and then seeing those pictures would stir those memories, what happened at that time. You know, you could relate and it would just wake up the whole visual thing would lead to the verbal thing. And so memories started pouring back in. Do you feel like 
the memories, I mean, how can you ever know? But do you feel like your memories are accurate? I think that the, <laughs> the pretty much I have had this book out now for a number of months. And people have very nicely sent me little emails with my typos, my missing <laughs> words, my extra words. And so far, only four mistakes of fact. Mm. So one woman said, for example, that it, uh, a lecture of Marishi that I thought was recorded in 1976, she said, no, it was 1974, I was there. <laughs> so, okay, I'll fix it. And so a few things like that have come up. And so and I got one boy's home country wrong and, you know. So, but very little, actually, very little. I feel that my memories are, are quite accurate and they are just the tip of the iceberg What's beneath the ocean is everything I've forgotten. <laughs> so people are saying, oh, you have a great memory. No, no, no. This is what I remember. There's a ton of what I don't remember. Wow. Wow. Do you, do you wish that you had taken more notes back then? You know, written more of maybe of your, what you were feeling at the time? I, I don't think so because as I started to write it, it all came back to life, and I remembered how I felt and how I acted and how I saw things, my viewpoint. And so that's what comes out in the book, and it's what people seem to be most appreciating is this authentic honesty, the way I saw it. I didn't really know what I was getting into, <laughs> and so I was sitting there going, where am I? What is going on? Who are these people? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I remember that very clearly. <laughs> and so, so I wrote all you that. You were living in El Paso, Texas when you first became exposed to transcendental meditation. And I love the way the way that you talk about um what convinced you to give it a try, which was your husband, the impact that it had on him. Yes, he had been inspired by a friend. So this friend had learned TM. And he could see that this friend, who I have to say was a little pretentious and always into something new, suddenly was his most authentic, grounded self. And my husband went, that's wonderful. That's really good. So we were trying to learn, but we were in El Paso. There was no way, no place, no local center, teacher, nothing. And one day he saw a little note on a bulletin board, want to enjoy life more? lecture on transcendental meditation. So he wrote it down very carefully and dragged me off to this lecture. <laughs> and the man giving the lecture was, I don't know, I, he seemed like a nice enough fellow. There was no scientific research at the time, which would have convinced me I was very materialist. Mm. Mathematics background, you know. I, I mean, how did I know what he was saying was true? How did I know that, you know? I mean, it sounded good. It was promising you the moon. So my husband learned, and I said, oh, I'll wait and see what happens to you. Mm. So, <laughs> so he went off to learn, and that afternoon, we took our little boy to a park, and um, he was, my husband was more relaxed in a public place than he had ever been. He was always very anxious in public places. He'd be having a thought, oh, there could be a sniper in that room who would shoot at me. He would have, you know, kinds of things, I, thoughts like that that would keep him from being really comfortable, relaxed, you know, and not vigilant and on edge. Uh, maybe some military something, I don't know. But anyway, mm -hmm. very uncomfortable. And there he was in the moment, fun, enjoying the park, enjoying our little boy. And I'm going, holy smoke. Whatever that is, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's something to that. And I had to wait six months before another teacher traveled to El Paso before I could learn. Now, I'm curious, the friend that inspired him in the first place, did he stick with it? Yes and no. He stuck with it for quite a while. He wanted to become a TM teacher, but life just didn't go that way. He, he was also trying to write plays and get into... Um, literature and theater and art, and he wandered off into other other things. And the first, the teacher, David's teacher. Are you? Do you know who that is? And are you still in touch with that person? We are not in touch with him. His name is Casey Coleman, and he's well known to be one of the first teachers of TM in the U.S. And people do know of him, and he's still around, and he's still there. We personally have not talked to him in a very long time. 
Okay. But but we did make contact with him afterwards. And my teacher uh, was Robert Winquist, who was on MU, MIU faculty for some time. And I ran into him here last summer. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so and he told me some stories. And yeah. Now, Rhoda, I'm, you know, when I read your bio that you had a BA in mathematics and philosophy and then a PhD in comparative literature, I'm just curious what, you know, mathematics and literature to most people are like, complete opposites. Now, I happen to to in, like both of them very much and and um but most people don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was a reader. I always was a reader. And literature was my first love. But my father who had not gone to college, he wanted me his eldest to have a college degree in something marketable. Hmm. He thought if I majored in mathematics, I could get a job. Now, of course, that's not true, because a, a, a BA in mathematics gets you nothing. If you wanted to have anything to do with math, you have to go get a PhD in it, and then you'd, maybe you'd be a professor. Engineering, yes, but mathematics, uh. no. So um, I did it dutifully. I, I majored in mathematics, and I did get a job with the engineering group of New England Telephone and Telegraph in Boston, and we worked on quality of landlines. I did that for a year. But I was always loving literature, reading novels, um, that was uh, that was my whole intellectual life was literature, and it was only uh, when when I was doing that job, being the programmer, you know, for the Apollo project, and he was taking a PhD at the University of Maryland. Your father? No, no, this David. Oh, David. This David. Okay. He was going for his PhD, and I was having this job and supporting us, and so at night for fun, I took literature courses in the night school there at the University of Maryland, and one of my professors, he said. You're the best one in the whole class. Why Why aren't you getting a degree in this? I said, in what? <laughs> he said, in comparative literature. And I said, what is it? <laughs> because I knew English, French. He said, well, we take the best of the world's literatures, and we like compare them and they, how they interact and all that. I said, oh, that sounds like good, because I always read Dostoevsky and all. So um, I said, oh, that sounds very interesting. He said, would you like to do that? And I said, well, I don't know. He said, okay, you're in. Send in an application. <laughs> so I, I, I sent in an application. I was accepted. And then the courses I was taking started to account for credit. And then again, I took a class with this professor. I remember it was on James Joyce's Ulysses. Mm -hmm. And I was reading it out loud to David. And we were laughing and laughing. So for the class, David wanted to come along and hear what the class was all about. So at the break time, the professor said, same guy, Melvin Friedman, why aren't you doing this full time? I said, I have a job. I'm supporting my husband. He's getting a PhD. And he said, well, what if I got you an assistantship, a graduate assistantship? Would you would you take that and, and, and quit your job and become full time? And I said, oh, no. And David said, oh, yes. Simultaneously. <laughs> simultaneously. So I quit my job. I got this assistantship as a, an assistant to the Department of Literature. I helped them put out their journal, Comparative Literature Studies, Okay. as a sort of junior editor. And I also did all the subscription work and all of that. And I also was an um, assistant teacher in the English department teaching composition and all of those things. So I left my my um, engineering and computer programming behind me and just went full tilt into literature. And be, and getting becoming a teacher, a professor, kind of by accident, it sounds like. Yes, it, was by, <laughs> yes, it kind of was. It was. It was really nature pushing me along. It was not in my program, you know, that I had imagined. But it fit. It was a good fit. I was very happy. I loved doing literature. And uh, and I really en always enjoyed teaching. And I certainly enjoyed reading. I still read a lot. And I felt, uh, I feel that writing this book is a form of teaching. You know, I I'm not teaching in the classroom anymore. But I was very conscious as I was writing it, that people would be reading it and learning from it. Learning about Marishi learning about what impact he had on the world, learning how a master works, learning how he was, his character. So I had that, you know, kind of in the back of my mind that I was making that kind of a contribution. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Rhoda Orm Johnson, author of Inside Maharishi's Ashram, A Personal Story. Now, if I recall, because I've been around Fairfield for a long time, my family moved here in 1972, uh, right as Parsons was closing. And uh, then the um, 
kind of the advanced team for MIU came, and my father was was um, very, he was an engineer, but he was very interested in organic farming and gardening and sustainable living, and that's why we moved to Iowa, because we lived in Pennsylvania, and he wanted to buy a farm to be able to live off the land. It was too expensive in Lancaster County, yeah. and it was much cheaper here. And he bought um, a farm in Davis County, Iowa was the choice because that's where my mother was from, mm. and her parents were still up in central Iowa, mm. which farmland was too expensive there, too, so he was looking in southern Iowa, and um, so he bought this farm and then looked for an engineering job within driving distance, and that's how we ended up in Fairfield. Uh-huh. So, uh, and his first job here, or his only job here, he worked for French Renneker, and he worked on the Rathbun Lake project. Ah. Yes, building. We building used to Lake sail Rathbun. on Rathbun Lake when, yeah, we, when yeah. we lived here. When we were on faculty, we had a little sailboat, and we would trail it out to Rathbun Lake and sail on it. Yeah, so that's a man-made lake. Yes, and so he worked on that, and uh, so when when MIU was coming here, my father was growing organic vegetables, and so he started supplying ah. the kitchen. So I'm sure you ate some of his ah, could vegetables. Be. He was also on, I believe, the first cities course that was here. Ah, so he became interest. You know, he became interested in TM mm-hmm. after MI from MIU coming here. Yeah, yeah. So, Marshy says the proof is in the pudding, <laughs> meaning that when you meet the the meditators you'll know there's something, they've got something, you want it, you know. And so people would learn. And he would say that the, our education, the st- kind of student we're turning out, that should demonstrate what we're doing. And, of course, you know, the students here, even the high school, they win all the state awards and everything, little tiny school, and they walk away with everything. So, yeah, that's what we create. We create that kind of student. So from um, Maryland... Did, was El Paso your next stop? Or? Yes. Uh, we went back to El Paso. My husband decided that he really wanted to be an artist, a sculptor. And his father had a big machine shop and steel fabricating business. They would provide the rebars and stairways and structural steel for buildings. And But he had a big shop. And David could go there as the son of the boss. And he could <laughs> weld and he could put things together and he could take all the scrap steel and he could make these sculptures. So we found ourselves in El Paso and his family lived there. And, you know, so that was a very comfortable place to be. Now, I had not finished my degree. He had. He had gotten his Ph.D., And so he had done that. But I hadn't. I still had a number of doctoral exams to take. I had finished my coursework. So uh, so I got a job at the University of Texas in El Paso teaching. And I um, started studying for those exams and taking them one by one as I was able to do it. So I was working on my Ph.D. in El Paso. And when the call came to start MIU in Santa Barbara, California, off we went. Now, would you have when you were finishing your PhD? Did you have to go back to Maryland to take each test, or I took the tests. <laughs> <laughs> I took some in Santa Barbara, ah. and I had one left when Marishi called us to Switzerland, <laughs> and we lived there for four years. I had one left. It was in the modern American novel. So when I was ready for it, I went up to the university uh, in Zurich. Ah, uh, no, yes, in Zurich. And I found the English department, and I asked if they would proctor the exam, meaning that the exam would be mailed to a professor there. I would go there and write it, and he would send it back. And so he would make sure that I was doing it, you know, properly. Right. So he agreed to do that, and I took my last exam while we were living in Switzerland. (laughs) And then I started looking for a dissertation topic. Marisha was very keen. He wanted me to get the Ph.D. And I would offer, I'd say, well, I'll write a book on the movement, I'll do this, get the PhD. Mm. So he didn't let me off the hook. But I wasn't able to complete it until we went back to MIU. We moved to MIU for the first time in uh, 1977. And I became a member of the literature faculty. And then I had libraries, University of Iowa Library. I had resources. I found a topic and I was able to write my dissertation and get that PhD finally. And what was your topic? My topic was transcending in myth and literature. So what I did was I found a a Latin novel called The Golden Ass, 
And at the center of it is a fairy tale, an art fairy tale, called Cupid and Psyche. And what it's about is Psyche, the soul, um, looking for love. And in order to get reunited with her lover and get immortalized, she has to visit the underworld and bring something back. Well, I could see that the underworld was a metaphor for the inner world Mm. and that what she had to do was go back onto the self and her instructions when she's told to go down there, don't say anything, don't do anything, don't help this person, don't do that, don't do anything. Effortless, down, 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 down. And then she pops up. She's reunited with her Cupid. They're both made immortal. The soul, Psyche, is made immortal. And the baby she's carrying is named Joy. (laughs) So this is in the middle of a very rough, I have to say, um, story of a young fellow who is looking for knowledge. He's looking for spiritual meaning, but he gets sidetracked by witchcraft. And so he puts the wrong potion on himself and gets turned into a donkey. And so for a long winter, he's a donkey. And he hears this story in his donkey hood And it inspires him. And when he is able to get his human body back, he goes right to the mysteries, which were the spiritual vehicles of that world, and to go get initiated. And in his initiation, he says, for example, I saw the sun at midnight, meaning he went inward and saw the inner light. Mm. See, so his life takes a completely different direction. So that Cupid and Psyche story, I saw that as the key to the novel. Not just some accidental story that Apuleius plopped in there along with all those other stories. No, it was essential. Now, no one else had that view. And I did all this research and I wrote, I made tables, this is my mathematical background. You know. <laughs> I made tables showing that this went to that, and that went to that, and this was added to go with that, and this was added to go with that. And it was all carefully laid out to this end. So that was my dissertation. Did you, were you, did you convince other scholars? My, my committee was convinced. <laughs> they accepted it without changes, which is practically unheard of. And I got the PhD, and it is in the back of my mind to, uh, things get buried. You get a PhD, it's in dissertation abstracts, it disappears, you know, into a black hole. It's in the back of my mind to write it in a more popular format. Right. Because I have not yet seen anyone who has had that view. And in fact, I gave a talk on it, and a woman got up and said this was very interesting. She had studied the golden ass at the University of Iowa, and her professor in this is recently, said that that story didn't belong in there, didn't go with the rest of the novel. What was it doing there? So no one's gotten it yet. So I had this feeling maybe my next book should be to tell that tale as it's meant to be told. Oh, interesting. In a popular, more yes. popular format. Forget the 300 references right, and the right. gazillion footnotes. You right. know, who cares about that? Right. But to tell that story, once upon a time, there was a king with three daughters. You know, right. and, and how it's all about going inward in order to get enlightened. Wow. It's the second century AD. There must be many other um, pieces of literature throughout history that have that theme hidden in it as well. Yes, because transcending is a natural thing. It's natural to go inward to go to a source of greater happiness, greater knowledge. It's natural. And people all over the world and from all periods of time have reported that experience. So it's natural, it's there, and naturally it would find its way into literature, even in the most unlikely places. I remember seeing an essay by Edgar Allan Poe. Remember that? Fall of the House of Usher, quote the raven, nevermore. Okay, there is a little essay in there when he says that between sleeping and waking, between sleeping and dreaming, in that gap, he is unbounded, knows mm. everything. This is, you know, this is an un- indescribable and amazing experience that he had, and he's written it. Just, just a little, you know, a few pages on that experience, which he had naturally. And just as Marishi describes, that's the gap. That's the gap between states of consciousness. We all pass through it as we wake up 
into waking, as we fall into a dream, as we come out of the dream, you know, we pass through it many, many times. The beauty of TM is that we linger there. We hover there. We sit on the edge and dabble our toes in it <laughs> for 20 minutes. And of the TM City program, the more advanced TM City program, we learn to kind of sit there and function from there. So it becomes not just a, you know, a random, occasional, indescribable, how did that happen? How can I capture that again? There's something reliable and, and experienceable. And the more it happens, the more one grows in the direction of enlightenment. Rhoda, do you think, has there been anyone who has collected those um, sort of reports that have found throughout history? Uh, um, Craig Pearson's book. I don't know if you've interviewed Craig, but he, have, has, he yeah. has a big book with these excerpts from poetry and philosophy. That's what I thought. I knew, yes. I, I knew that I had yes. seen Yes, and seen they one. are absolutely yeah. stunning. And he's organized them kind of by stages. So you have the, the, the person just transcending, and then you have the person who's maybe a little bit established or moving into CC. So he has them all um, in order. And they're from various sources all over the world, all different philosophies and languages. And, they're, and they, they show the reality of this very natural progression. The only thing that's unnatural is that we've lost our modern society, the ability to get there. We don't know how to do it. We need a little help. We need a technique. And once we have the technique, we're on the way. So, but they're there. And the, the, the most spiritual, the most highly evolved people in any culture have these experiences. And in fact, recently, Fred Travis came up with a brain integration scale where he showed these were the qualities that best described a highly evolved person. And he discovered that they were to be found in the most successful musicians, athletes, business people, not meditating necessarily. But that this brain integration scale, which is common in meditators, is also common in these top people in society. So that means that's why they're at the top. They have the brain that shows it. <laughs> and that's the brain we're all trying to get. So, <laughs> so it shows that that is the practical direction of it all. Enlightenment is not some airy fairy thing. It takes you to be the best of whatever you can be. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Rhoda Orm Johnson, author of Inside Maharishi's Ashram, A Personal Story. You talked, I, when you said that, you know, that enlightenment is getting you to be the best that you can be, there was a phrase that I recall reading in your book where Maharishi referred to somebody being in grumpy CC, <laughs> and, and that was appalling to you because you were really, really hoping that this whole thing was going to make you not grumpy. Yeah. <laughs> so how'd that go? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did have a tendency, a little bit irritability, grumpiness, you know, and so I didn't want to hear about grumpy CC. Now, I think what Marjorie was saying was that this person thought he was in CC and was promoting himself as being in CC. Which means being enlightened. Being enlightened. Yes. And, yeah. you know, and because he was grumpy, this was kind of an indication that perhaps he wasn't what he said he was. So we didn't quite, I didn't quite know how to take it. Maybe he was in CC and still grumpy. Anyway, I didn't want to be grumpy. And um, thank God, over the years, I'm less grumpy. <laughs> less. Still sometimes grumpy, but, but, but generally, you know, happier and more. Well, you, you don't seem very grumpy today. I, well, you know, I have my moments. <laughs> <laughs> I have my moments. <laughs> so, Rhoda, when you decided to, to put your story down on paper, and you said it just sort of poured out, was this... All day, every day, or? No, I wanted to use my best brain. And my best brain is a morning brain. <laughs> so I would get up, uh, do, my, do my meditation, have breakfast, have a cup of tea, and go into my, my little office and write for a couple hours. And then I would come out and have lunch, and that was the end of that. I would pay bills, do other things. My afternoon brain is not as um, inspired as my morning brain. <laughs> so so I just wrote in the mornings. And then I would I would print out what I wrote and I'd read it to my husband that evening. 
And he, who was in the story, he, of would, course. <laughs> he would laugh, he would cry. So I thought, oh, okay, uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm onto something here. Oh. So that was encouraging. Are you one of these people who writes, like, pushes forward, you know, write, 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 and then goes back and starts editing, or do you, are you one of these people who edits as you go? I, I write, and I believe that you should let it flow out and not have the editor sitting on your shoulder, um, holding you back, um, making you self-conscious. I think you should just flow. And that's what I did. And then when I read it over, I improved. Oh, I thought, oh, this needs a little more explanation. Um, this needs a little more of that. And so the next year and a half was involved in editing, proofing, getting it uploaded onto uh, Create Space, you know, my self publisher, getting it put into Kindle, uploading the Kindle. So the first four months were just a spontaneous flow. And then, and I had other people read it, and they said, mm, this is maybe needs some explaining, you know. So they, they made their comments, and I tried to um, respond to as many of those as I could, you know. And, okay, if, they, if that bothered them, if they stumbled over that, I have to fix it. And even now, people are telling me what they've stumbled over. For example, I've ha it's been read by new meditators, and they'll say, uh, I, I've forgotten what all these... Um, initials stand for these abbreviations you know well tm of course they got but there right. were some other ones yeah so yeah. i've decided for second edition i'm going to have a list of abbreviations that they can refer to and my very first book club is reading you know book club reading my book for them uh. and in the book club are three non-meditators i like to say not yet meditators three <laughs> new meditators and the lady whose turn it was to choose the book and she's a tm teacher so she's chosen the book so i'm trying to get this list of abbreviations and maybe a little glossary ready for her to give these people so that they'll have it while they're reading it and i said ask them ask them what's giving them trouble what they might need more explanation you know how can i help because i want it to go, I want it to be widely read. It's not just for people who've had this experience and know who Marshy is. Because as I entered into it, not knowing what it was, they can enter into it too, not knowing what it is, and learn as I learned. So I don't want to have stumbling blocks in their way. You know what else would be interesting, although this would be more for perhaps for people who do, who are familiar with the movement, but um, a timeline. Mm. I do, and I was told I didn't have enough dates in it. Mm. So I've gone back and added them <laughs> uh, because they go, where are we, when are we? And so I've gone in, in the second edition, it'll say, in 1975, da, da, da. And that's going to make it more uh, accessible that way. And other teachers, uh, people who are in the TM movement, have said, oh boy, this, this not only reminded me of when I was there and I was at that place and that place, but filled in the spaces in between when I didn't know what was happening. Mm. So it's functioned like that for yes. them. Yeah. So yes. And then this one reader said, now, who is Marishi? Where did he come from? So I thought, oh, okay. So I'm going to have a page who is Marishi, and try to give a little of the backstory. Because I didn't give the backstory. I just had me sitting there in the audience looking up and saying, "What? who is this guru person and how in the world did I get here? <laughs> so I need a little backstory. And then my one of my new uh, readers thought she was going to learn TM from the book. Ah. So I'm going to have in the appendix, what is TM? Because you can't learn it from a book. You need right. a teacher. Yeah. Because the, the mechanics of learning are geared to your profile and reactions. And you learn get bit by bit guided. And depending upon your responses comes the next instruction. So you can't learn it from a book. You know, you have to have your eyes closed and you have to be with, <laughs> with a real professional trained TM teacher. So you were surprised at finding yourself with a guru. Yes. I'm guessing that with your father being someone encouraging his daughter to get a degree in mathematics, that probably this was a little outside his expectation, too. <laughs> well, he had died by then, unfortunately, uh, my beloved father. 
But my mother learned TM and all my sibs, and they took to it. Mm. So that was very gratifying. <laughs> um, and in fact, some of my aunts also um, learned TM and took to it. So, And my father was very open. He was very, um, he was an open, broad-minded man. He wanted me to be able to earn a living, but he was not conservative in that, mm. in that way. I remember, I'll just tell this whole story here. My brother liked to roll his own cigarettes you know, real, real. So he got the papers and the tobacco and he rolled his own cigarettes. And my father found this little jar that said marijuana on it. And he got these cigarettes from my brother and he put them in the jar. And then when my mother's brothers would come over, he'd say, would you like one? <laughs> <laughs> of course, they were horrified. They never took one. And it, <laughs> but he played with them like that. Oh. He thought they were very staid. Man. Anyway, so he liked the joke. He liked the good joke. I think he would have. I think he would have learned. David's parents did. They learned. And did they? It was good. Yeah, they got good things out of it. Yes. Yeah, yeah oh. they did. Oh. So, how many places in the world have you lived with? You know, because of your involvement with TM. Well, hmm. Well, we started out, let's see, we went off to Switzerland and moved around Switzerland and France for four years. Um, we were the first teachers to teach behind the Iron Curtain. So David lived in, in uh, Moscow and Armenia for six months, I for three. Um, we spent various long periods of time in India. We spent a couple of weeks in South Africa helping the South African movement. We were there during apartheid. Wow. And our movement was integrated which was probably illegal at the time. Mm. We went to a TM residence course in the Drakenburg Mountains, and there was a black TM teacher on that course sitting and eating with everyone else. That was unheard of mm. in the rest of the country. You could not do that in the rest of the country. So we were there then. And so basically, um, not as many countries, unfortunately, as my husband has visited. And of course, we spent long periods of time in Holland also, and... Um, just so many places. And in our own travels have taken us. Me, I love France. So yeah. weeks and weeks in Paris and the Dordogne and, uh, you know, like that. Mexico, we love Mexico. Now, were your children always with you at, in these different places? Yes, as long until they went off to college. Yes, wow. they were. And uh, that was often a challenge, raising children, at being on the move all the time, because in Switzerland we moved quite frequently. We were in the Alps in the summer when no one was skiing. We were down on the lakes in the winter when no one was swimming. So we had to move back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> and so we had to pack up and move all the time. And they became very flexible. And um, they were with us all the time. It was, people say, how did you do that? Oh, my God, raising children under those circumstances. But, you know, you wake up in the morning. You do what you have to do that day. You go to bed at night. I love that phrase from the Bible, sufficient to the day, the worries thereof. <laughs> so you just deal with what you have to deal with today. And somehow the months go by, the years go by. And when you look back, you go, how did I do that? You know, how did I live through that? But we've all had those experiences where yeah. we've had a financial challenge, a family challenge, a sickness challenge. I got breast cancer twice. You put mm. one foot in front of the other. That's what, it's the only practical thing to do. <laughs> it is. It is. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Rhoda Orm Johnson, author of Inside Maharishi's Ashram, A Personal Story. And this is your uh, second book? Yes. And the first was The Flow of Consciousness, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi on Literature and Language. And when was that written and published? That was while we were at MIU, and Marshi made these various tapes at symposia or when guests would come. There was a woman from Germany, Erica, Professor Erica Lorenz, and she would come see Marshi and she'd give a, a talk on literature and he'd answer. And we used to play these tapes for the lit students because Marshi would talk about how literature worked on consciousness, how it affected consciousness, what you needed as a student to do, as a teacher to do. Um, and he talked about various the ways literature works and is evolutionary mm -hmm. for the student. So I said to him at one point, um, I would like to transcribe these talks and make them into a book 
So it could be a scholarly reference. It could be cited. People could put in a footnote where they got this phrase. It could be the exact phrase. You know, it would be a very valuable academic tool. So we said, yeah, go ahead, do it. (laughs) So I did it, and I collected 17 talks, along with my colleague, Susan uh, Anderson, collected 17 talks, and I wrote a general introduction to the volume with the whole history of the movement, as a whole history timeline of the movement in the beginning of that book, and then an introduction to the literature section, summing up his major points. Susan did one for the language section, summing up his major ideas. So that I worked on there, and I actually finished it before we left um, in 94, but it wasn't actually published until after he passed. So he died in 2008, and at that point, I said to the then heads of the of the TM movement and the university, I have this book, and it would be a great book for people. You know, mm-hmm. for every physicist we have, we've got 10 novel readers. You know, yeah. they would like to hear this. Yeah. So they gave me the go ahead, and we published the book, and it came out in 2010, actually. Oh, wow. Long after. <laughs> I had, but by the time, you see, they said to go ahead and do it, uh, I had to bring the introduction up to date because 20 years had passed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had to bring, I alluded to the scientific research. I had to bring that up to date. 20 years and hundreds of of, uh, scientific studies had passed and so forth. They said, why, we should have an index. Okay, (laughs) we'll write an index, you know. Did you do the indexing yourself? I did. Wow. I did. So all of those things had to be done. And so by the time it was done and and out, it it was the fall of 2010. Well, you said you came to Fairfield, for MIU in 1977. Yeah. Why don't you read us a little bit from the book about that time of your life? Okay. Well, um, it was a time. Marshy wanted us to go and reinvigorate MIU. I would, you know, go there and work in administration or whatever. David would take over the faculty in the psychology department. And because MIU had started in 1973. Three mm, or four? Yes, and then moved to Fairfield in 76, I think. Summer of 76, maybe? No, earlier than that. 75, maybe? Pro- I think 74. Uh, yeah, could be. 74. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think 74, because yeah. that's when I, I learned to meditate in 74. Yeah. So, so we were in Switzerland here. at that time. Okay. So the time came for us to get back. So um, we were, uh, Marishi came on and, you know, said... Uh, um, it would be good to go, and don't forget to finish the PhD. <laughs> okay, so we we uh, uh, here's the end of part two, where I the part two is all about those years in Europe with Marishi. So we got there. The apartment we were to have was in an old fraternity building that had been made into faculty apartments. It was not yet available that apartment, so we would stay in some rooms nearby until it was. We got into the small plane and took off over the fields of Iowa in the sunset and arrived at the tiny airport in Fairfield, just north of the campus. We went to bed in our spare, unfamiliar rooms and woke up the next morning in another universe. We had left the intense but silent whirlwind that was life around Marshy and had landed softly in the quiet middle of nowhere. (laughs) Our new life would begin here in Fairfield, Iowa, a life that would last 19 years before everything changed yet again. And I say here, let me say here that although we were now in Iowa, thousands of miles away from Marishi and from our old life in Switzerland, surrounded by farms and acres of cornfields, I felt and continue to feel connected to Marishi. I sensed that he was and is guiding my evolution and that I should just work with what came along. The whole mission of the university was Maharishi's project to bring Vedic knowledge, the knowledge of consciousness, into the academic world. Everyone at MIU felt the same way, faculty, staff, and our first students, who were largely our own initiators or governors, and, uh, as, and if they had already taken the TM City course, and their children. We all wanted MIU to succeed. 
We all wanted Murray Shee's attention and approval. Over the years, David frequently toured and visited Murray Shee wherever he was. We both went to big courses he was holding, and sometimes we went over to Switzerland or elsewhere for special projects. So we felt very close to him and his projects. We felt that we were still in the ashram a part of his movement, and under his eye and direction. We gave ourselves wholeheartedly to making MIU a success in whatever way we could. Now, when you left MIU, do you, write, do you talk much about that in the book? Yes, a bit. Um, we had gotten a message from Marishi, and he said, we reached that time in life when what we do should bring us joy. And we had to look at each other and admit that we had gotten a bit stale and we weren't enjoying so much and that maybe it was time for our evolution to move on. Now, it was a very difficult decision to take because our children, both grown up, lived in Fairfield, one expecting a baby, and to go off somewhere else and start all over again but Marishi felt that that was what we should do for our evolution. It took us about a year and a half to actually tear ourselves away, uproot ourselves, and get us and establish ourselves in Florida, where we now live. So it wasn't an immediate thing. And the university was very kind to support us in that year and a half while we made this transition. But the advice had come from Marishi, and we knew that it was for our evolution as uncomfortable and difficult as it was at times to leave our home and all of our friends and our status and everything and go start afresh somewhere else. But we took that to heart and off we went. So you had been teaching for many years at that point? About 19. About 19 years. So you go to Florida. Now what? Now what? <laughs> yes, a good. Yeah, now what? Yeah, now what? Well, first of all, we went to some of the local universities and colleges to see if we would teach for them. Oh, it was just horrible, horrible. And they didn't pay anything. I mean, you'd be better off working at McDonald's, I tell you, financially speaking. So that was not an option. So we started out, David had some papers to write. He was still doing research. So he worked on those. And um, I thought, well, we could always have a TM center. So we did that. We started teaching TM, having residence courses. The TM teacher in our area was Dear Prudence. So she didn't really want us stepping on her toes. So we, <laughs> we taught in Birmingham and Panama City and Fort Walton Beach. We drove a lot. And um, it was difficult. It was really very difficult. And uh, after a number of years, I realized it was just not working for us. The movement was in a little bit of a slump at that time. So um, I went into real estate, and that proved to be very, very successful for us. Now, what, what, you know, I'm just curious, why real estate? Why, you know, what about it made you think, this is something that I would like to do? <laughs> well, I always was curious about house, houses. I never saw a piece of land I didn't like. But what <laughs> happened, what happened was um, I had had Jyotish consultations over the years, with the Marishi Jyotish. Now, Jyotish is Indian astrology. It's very different from Western astrology. It's very accurate and it's predictive. And it's not so much about personality, it is about events and how the various planetary influences influence events. So I would sit with a, a Jyotishi, an expert in this, and he would open up my chart and he would go, ah, real estate. <laughs> and I would say, real estate? I'm a professor at the university. And he'd go, oh yeah, that's there too. <laughs> so it came to this point, and I thought, ah, oh, real estate. So there was a course being offered when we got back that fall over a couple of weekends. And I thought, well, you know, I'll just try it. And it was just so comfortable. It was a shoe that fit. Mm. And I got into it just as our area was coming out of a recession and was playing catch up with South Florida. And there was just a rush on, you know, a crazy um, excitation of the market. And I rode this up 
and I became one of the top realtors in my area. I was in the top one and a half percent of the realtors in my area within a year or two, and doing twenty million dollars of business a year. Wow! And it enabled us to establish a kind of, I would say, modest self-sufficiency, to take that money and put it into investments so that we would have a steady flow of income, not job-related, from rentals, from this and that and the other thing, so that we were um, independent. Because working for the university and the movement before that, wasn't particularly financially lucrative. It was, was a it? labor of love. Yes, it was a labor of love. We were given housing and a car and uh, food and medical care and all of that, but not much cash, a little cash, with a little heart on the kids. Yeah. <laughs> they always wanted something um, that we could barely afford. So it was kind of nice. I really enjoyed having all that money. I could be generous and give to charities. Mm. I could help my family. I could... We go to a restaurant and read the column about the food, not the column about the prices. <laughs> and decide what I wanted to eat, not what I could afford to eat. Yeah. So that was really nice. And I never went for expensive clothes or cars or anything like that. I was much too utilitarian. But it was nice to know that if I fell in love with a particular item, I could afford it. Yeah. I could buy it, yeah. even though it wasn't what I would normally do. I could do it. It was a kind of a freedom. It was very freeing in a way, to suddenly have money and not be always pinching pennies, you know, and not able to do things. And so it was a great step in my evolution that in that way, that it just gave me a great security and freedom. In another way, it also gave me a great self-confidence, which mm. I was rather lacking. Mm. And so to see that I could enter a field that I was totally unfamiliar with, and rise to the top. My husband said, cream rises to the top. So, but I did. I rose to the top, and it gave me a lot of confidence. I could do this. I could do anything. I can do anything. Yeah. Well, you know, they say money doesn't buy happiness, but it does help solve a lot of problems. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And the lack of money can definitely create unhappiness. unhappiness. Yes. yes. So it's yeah. good to have an ample sufficiency. Yeah. I think sometimes people have too much. Their children go bad. It's uh, it's good to work for a living. Um, I think a modest amount of money is very good, very good. I do not aspire to a private plane or riches <laughs> or a house too big for me to clean. In a little time, I want to a lot to it. <laughs> I'm with you there. Yeah. I'm with you there. Rhoda, why, let's talk about the title of yes. your book, Inside Maharishi's Ashram. Yes. Were you ever technically in a, an ashram? And what exactly is an ashram? Yes, well, an ashram is traditionally a hermitage where the saint, the master, lives. So when Maharishi wanted to get enlightened, he went to be with his master, Gurudev, in his ashram. So when I joined Maharishi, he was living in Switzerland. So he wasn't living in the typical kind of ashram, but it was an ashram in that sense. And so for those four years, we were in the same building mm -hmm. as, as Marshi, and we were seeing him every day, and he was guiding our day-to-day -day evolution. And it was exactly like being in an ashram, although we weren't in India, we were in Switzerland or France. <laughs> it was the same thing. And I felt, as I read you in that MIU passage, as long as we were, we felt connected with him, which we still do, then I felt that we were still in the ashram. It's not, it's not a location. It's not a place. It's a state of mind. It's a two-way street that's open and running in both directions. So that's the way I define it in the book. And I thought, oh, people will be curious. They'll see the title and they'll think, well, what was that like? And they'll be drawn to the book, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> what made you decide to self-publish this rather than go to a independent press? Well, I felt I had a niche book that this niche book, it would first appeal to the meditators. And I had access to them in many ways. And an independent press might not be so interested in it. And I didn't want to go through the year or two of while they considered it and edited it in, according to their lights. So, and also they don't give you very much money. They give you like a couple percentages points of that. You know, I would, uh, this book, I would probably make $2.50 a volume 
And so I decided to self-publish, and that would cut out a lot of problems. And a lot it, everybody was doing it. It was the rage of the time. I had p- friends who had done it. Prudence, dear Prudence, had done it. Mm. So I, I thought um, I, the way was paved. And then some friends of ours who were designers and had published newsletters and things like that had access to to uh, pro computer programs that would make the book look like a really like published by a top university wide margins a good typeface you know they and uh, unlimited pictures i've got 58 photos in there and so they made it easy for me and um it was it just that's just the door that opened and i walked right through it wonderful wonderful now you talked about maybe doing something with your thesis as as a book. Do you have any other books that you would like to write? Well, <laughs> people have said, what about volume two? <laughs> <laughs> so David and I were recently on a movement project in Ukraine, and that turned out to be quite an adventure. It turns out my mother and her family came from Ukraine. Mm. So um, I, I might write that up. And so I thought, oh, yes, volume two could be called here and now, the adventure continues. <laughs> and as events come up over the next years that would uh, generate a, a chapter, I might write that up and collect them. More occasional pieces, you know, mm-hmm. not because obviously the next 45 years, you know, I'm 77. So <laughs> the next 45 years, I'm going to be too old to write this book and all my readers will be dead too. So <laughs> obviously <laughs> something different is going to have to come along. You so, know, that's, we only have a couple minutes left, but one of the things early on, and you allude to this in here is this idea that learning, that learning to him and becoming enlightened will bestow immortality. Um, What's your belief about that now? And was there any disappointment when people started dying? Well, you know, when we first learned TM, we thought no one would ever die. No one would ever get sick. Someone asked Marishi about that. And he says, well, history shows everyone dies. You know, I mean, and you got to die of something. <laughs> and sickness is part of your karma, whatever that is. So we learned that, yes, people do die, have normal lifespans and so forth and so on. So... um I don't know exactly what's going to happen when we pass through that barrier over to the other side. I suspect that there is something there, and we aren't at the end, you know, when we drop the body here. But uh, who knows? Until (laughs) until you know, you you don't know. So, uh, but I am so um, I am so not disappointed. Mm. in what TM has done for my life and my happiness and my progress and those around me that I feel totally blessed, totally satisfied with that. So I'm not, uh, I'm not looking, you know, for some, uh, I want to live in the now and enjoy life in the now, but I see that evolution is the way things work. We can go slowly, we can go quickly, but we are going to evolve regardless. Well, I will say, you know, one of the joys of your book for me is reading about Nate, because he's my business partner and very dear friend, and your son. And so it's and seeing the such cute pictures of him. (laughs) (laughs) He was he was an adorable, very bright, challenging child. Uh, Yes, I and he's all of those adjectives still I think, um, apply. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Rhoda. And do you have any um, upcoming readings or anything that people I should do, know about? I do. I'm going to have a book signing at Health and Wholeness on the September Art Walk. I will have a, a reading sometime, but I would direct readers to my website, which is rhodatherwriter.com slash memoirs. And on the memoirs page, I post where the book's available, where I'll be speaking next, how they can get a hold of me. And there are some tidbits and Uh, There's information there, links to buy the book from me or from Amazon or from Kindle. (laughs) So it's all on that page, rotatherwriter.com. Rotatherwriter.com slash memoir. All right. See you next week on Writer's Voices. Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline is a production of KRUULP 100.1 FM, produced